Hello everyone, welcome to the first webinar of the East Asian Digital Scholarship Series. I'm Kotlin Tang, Digital China Fellow of Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. Um, Kevin Mazzilla, Japan Digital Scholarship Librarian of the Japan Digital Research Center and I will be the host today. Um, the East Asian Digital Scholarship Series, founded by Feng En Tu and Sharon Yang, has been a monthly luncheon at Harvard Yanjing Library. This year, the series will be conducted remotely and is sponsored by Harvard Yanjing Library with the support of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, Weishao Institute of Japanese Studies, and Korea Institute. Um, unlike traditional academic works, an excellent digital scholarship project does not end when books and articles are published. It requires long-term maintenance. Today, we invite the leaders of four long-running East Asian digital scholarship projects to share their experience in building and managing their digital scholarship projects. In the advertisement, we call this project North American-based, um, but the more appropriate word should be North American originate because they are international collaboration now. I will introduce the two speakers of the China Related Project and my colleague Catherine will introduce the two speakers of the Japan State Related Project. The first speaker is Dr. Peter Bo, Charles H. Caswell Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, Harvard University. Professor Bo has led the development of the China Biological Sorry, but sorry, China Biographical Database Project, CBDB, since the late 1990s. The project originated from the data set and a software program created by late Robert Hartwell. By May 2020, users of CBDB can access the biographical information of approximately 470,000 individuals and use them for statistical, um, sorry, statistical, social network and spatial analysis. The second speaker today is Dr. Grace Fong, Professor of Chinese Literature and Department Chair of East Asian Studies, McGill University. Professor Fong has been the project director of the Mainchain Women's Writing Project since 2005. The project is dedicated to the digitalization of collections of writing by women in late imperial China. From the project website, users can access the digitally scanned image of 401 collections of writing by women in the holdings of participating libraries. Uh, Catherine, can you introduce the two speakers of the Japan related project? Thank you. Yes, our third speaker today is um, Professor Helen Hardiker, Reichauer Institute Professor of Japanese Religions and Society at Harvard University, and also the founding director of the Reichauer Institute Research Project on Constitutional Revision in Japan, uh, which was first launched in 2005 as a web archiving project when uh, Japan's LDP party um, announced its intention to pursue changes in the uh, longstanding post-war constitution. And our final speaker uh, for today is Professor Andrew Gordon, a Lee and Juliet Folger Fund Professor of History at Harvard University, as well as um, Project Director of the Japan Digital Disasters Digital Archive since its founding in 2011, when the uh, triple disaster um, of earthquake, tsunami, and uh, nuclear meltdown struck Japan. Um, it's a digital archive that incorporates uh, web archiving, heat map searching, crowdsourcing, and uh, federated searches search it. across um, yes. dozens of yes. partner archives. Without further ado, let me hand over the Zoom podium to Professor Peter Bull to help us get started this morning or this evening, wherever you may be. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for attending. I'm going to share my screen now. and. I believe you can see it. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, the assumption you want to build a database and the kinds of questions we've had to answer along the way. And I'll get this done, I hope, within around 15 minutes. So um, possibly this. 
Now, um, just to, the biographical database project is, as you've already heard a little bit about it, I just want to recognize that Michael Fuller is the architect, Wang Hong Su is the uh, senior project manager. And one question to ask is, well, who is it for? Uh, is it for me or is it for you and me? Where you, of course, is innumerable people with innumerable interests. Um, and the second then, what does it cover? Does it cover my research, my own research, or does it cover yours too? Again, I don't know what yours is. So in thinking about that, one of the things we face is, well, what's the time period for us? Well, the time period in this case is around 1500 years, although eventually it'll be longer. Um, and we start to collect different kinds of information. So 470,000 people, but we're also interested in their social associations, teacher, student, um, friend, friend, places where they're from, where they live, where they die, their names, their kinship relations, how if they entered office, uh, government office, how they entered it by examination, by privilege, and so on, or what books they wrote, or what paintings they painted. And why do we want to know this? What's going to make this kind of information useful? What makes it useful is the ability to relate different kinds of information to each other. So I could say, well, I want to know what, uh, where a person served, where he was posted to, um, but that's a place and it's an office. And so I would like to be able, in fact, to look at all the people who served in that place or all the people who held that office in a certain time period or all the people that were related to each other through marriage or through teacher-student relations and so on. That is what makes a relational database useful. Um, and then, of course, you want to be able to take that data and output it into social networks, into, into, into graphs, and statistical graphs into maps showing locations and relationships. And for all of this, and this is crucial, the first sort of thing, you need an architect. Designing a relational database um, that gets complicated like this, um, unless you have experience, unless you're willing to spend a great deal of time, you really need to find a colleague who has experience, who has thought through the issues of design and how we use databases to model lives in this case. And it's once you have that in mind that you can start to make the queries that we see here. Now, um, once you have queries, you can start to generate data. And if you have the data, then you can start to create the, uh, the visualizations and the statistics that I mentioned. But for all of this, you need a project manager and a project manager who has the necessary skills and a full-time project manager. Um, for academics who are doing this kind of work, that's not just for their own research, not just for their limited period of time or subject, having somebody who can actually manage the project and think about all the different aspects of it is really essential. And what are those different aspects? Well, one thing is, how do you manage the many stages of the workflow? Gathering data efficiently. And this is just an example of the kinds of factoids we find in biographical texts. And we need to use computational methods to extract that data, always in Chinese, if I've just included uh, an English translation to give you a sense, different kinds of data. Yellow is names. Uh, Green is offices, red is how people entered offices, purple is social relationships, and so on. Um, so this is, in this case, we were using regular, what are called regular expressions. But today, people have started to use neural networks, which is beta, basically in the area of artificial intelligence, but which gives us much better recall and precision than regular expressions. Uh, but neural networks really involves in having collaborators who are computer scientists. You need a manager also to maintain online systems. Online systems change or the software changes and your ability to migrate your, your work 
is absolutely essential. Um, we are starting to experiment with crowdsourcing systems, and that has to be developed as well and maintained. And you need groups of editors, uh, collaborators who are examining the data that is being provided, either generated through neural networks or through crowdsourcing, to actually give it a final check. Is it right? Does it make sense? Are there obvious errors? And you need to manage collaborators and users around the world. This is actually last month's a map of users of the China Biographical Database um, who have accessed the website in some way. Um, and the last point I want to make is actually um, a very simple one, is that we need sustainability. Sustainability um, is difficult. The China Biographical Database has cost at this point, I would say on the order of a million and a half dollars funded initially by a bequest from the late Robert Hartwell, then by uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities with some money from the Fairbank Center, the Asia Center, the Luce Foundation for the, uh, through collaboration with Professor Fong, uh, the uh, Canadian uh, uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the China, um, the, the John Jingwo Foundation, but the important thing um, is that you can't be sustained by grants forever. And if you can't be sustained by grants forever, you need, simply need to figure out how it's going to be paid for. Because an open-ended database that's not finished, that's not dead, that never will be finished, that will be an ongoing project, um, has to actually, will cost money because you have to have people who are doing the work maintain it. And this is why I say my saying for the day is commercialization is popularization. We are very fortunate to be able to work with a Chinese company which is taking the China Biographical Database data and making it available in China to libraries for a subscription fee, which in turn helps support our work and our personnel. And they've taken our basic data and they've started to add on to it. They make it possible to do mapping online, to see social relationships, to see connections to original texts, to digital libraries, to um, understand the, uh, the, the, uh, the contents of the database in new and useful ways. So we have benefited enormously by being able to have collab commercial collaborators. Um, and in fact, they are much better at making our data accessible to users than we are ourselves. So that's been a, a great, great advance for us. That's all I have to say, um, but just leaving you with really two thoughts, find collaborators, find people who understand how to build the architecture and find ways of uh, having pro a project manager and paying the salary you need to pay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bo. Um, the second speaker will be Professor Grace Fong. Um, Professor Grace Fong. the uh, homepage of um, the Ming Women's Writings. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to just um, first um, start with a little bit uh, more background uh, on um, the Ming Ting Women's uh, Writings Digital Archive and Database Project. Um, and then um, some uh, later on, I would make some points that uh, either reinforce, reinforce what uh, some of uh, Professor Peter Bo has uh, said in relation to CBDB and um, also some um, areas that um, in our experience uh, have differed from CBDB. So the project was launched 15 years ago in 2005. Uh, the project began actually in 2003 as a collaboration with the Harvard Yanjing 
library and um, I um, uh, want to express my gratitude to um, James Jung, the director uh, of uh, the Harvard Yenjing Library um, and his support for the project at the beginning. So the Harvard Yenjing Library provided the digitized images of 96 collections of women's poetry and prose writings in the rare book collection. And the McGill Library Digital Initiative, Initiatives team designed the database and developed the project with my input uh, as part of McGill University Library's digital collections. So in Professor Bo's parlance, then the McGill Library Digital Initiatives, Initiatives team um, was the architect uh, of uh, this uh, database and um, working with me as sort of like an advisor or consultant. The freely accessible online Mingqing Women's Writings Digital Archive now contains 401 collections from seven participating libraries, uh, with the largest number of collections coming from the National Library of China, about 250 collections, and the smallest number, two collections only, from the Hong Kong Baptist, Baptist University Library. So we don't discriminate in quantity. Um, you have uh, appropriate texts, we welcome them. Currently data in about uh, 40 collections is still being or will be entered into the database. The database and website are updated annually in December. I estimate that by December um, next year to 2021, data entries for all collections that we have now will have been completed and the, uh, and the remaining collections will be uh, published to the website. So would that be the end? So let's look at this. Um, to do that, I want to sort of uh, look at the life course uh, of a digital project uh, drawing from the experience of Mingqing women's writings. I, um, I'll share a few reflections um, from curating uh, this uh, project. I think this specific case can be generalized and applied to other digital scholarship projects. And actually, we, I share some of the same points with Professor um, Bo, but I'll put them in the form first uh, post as a few basic questions and answers. What gives birth to a digital scholarship project? What makes it grow and develop? And what makes it sustainable? And that was a point emphasized very much by Professor Bo. What difficulties lie in this path and what does, uh, or where and when does it end? First, digital scholarship projects to me are by definition research driven. They are born out of research needs and uh, both individual and collective. So this project was born out of my own and other scholars research on women's history and culture, um, in my case, specifically literature in the Ming and Qing periods. Now looking back in hindsight, the Ming Qing Women's Writings Project was born lucky, I would say. It had from the very beginning funding. Um, the first one was actually from the McGill Alumni Family Foundation. And we had institutional support, um, specifically um, technical support from McGill University Library. And that relates to, of course, uh, sustainability. As I mentioned earlier, the digital archive was from the beginning developed as part of the digital collections of McGill University Library. We're happy that Mingxing Women's Writings has been for many years, the most accessed among 50 some uh, of McGill's digital collections. When funding and institutional support are secured at the beginning, so that's really important, they lay an important foundation for further development. They provide leverage when applying for further funding. And in our case, we were successful in getting major multi-year funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada the Henry Luce Foundation um, and the CCK Foundation, plus you know, other contributions. Uh, funding supports collaboration and uh, Professor Bo has shown um, the importance of that too, um, funding and collaboration. We were able to collaborate with CBDB to develop biographical data, which was an oversight in the original database designed, focused on literary research and the date database structure cannot be changed. So through collaboration with CBDB, 
um, we found a, a solution to this difficulty. And we also learned from CBDB to provide a downloadable access database for research researchers interested in working with um, uh, Mingqian women's writings data sets. Funding facilitated collaboration with other libraries and universities in China to grow the project by digitizing additional materials to add to the archive. Currently, we are collaborating on the uh, I, 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 uh, Talented Women project with the Institute of Modern History to explore, uh, that's at the Academia Seneca, to explore women's culture in the late Qing and early uh, Republican periods. Funding, importantly, also supports graduate student assistants and postdocs. And I cannot emphasize um, enough uh, how important the contribution of graduate student assistants are to this project, especially in data inputting and management over the years. Um, we only had a project manager at the very beginning phase of the project. And after that, you know, basically, we are working as um, a group. Um, so the student, the grad students have developed you know, in, in a very important way, developed and sustained the project over the years and many generations of them. Um, finally, uh, user demand, and I think um, Professor Bo also mentioned that, uh, user demand helps to grow the project, both at the beginning and in its continuity. You know, in, initially we projected a research need um, uh, for these, uh, you know, uh, very difficult to access primary uh, resources. And subsequently, both the research field and the archive have grown uh, together. Now, so the question, the final question, would this then be um, the end now? I think not. Uh, because of the nature of this digital project, it is housed in the library as part of its permanent collection. So we don't work, um, we can't even think of, uh, and we cannot do it, we cannot do the commercial, um, commercialization that Professor Bo had um, mentioned. And so even if the digital archive does not continue to increase in size, by next year, uh, when we have completed all the collections that we have currently, it will contain almost half of all estimated surviving collections of women's writing from the Ming and Qing periods. So in other words, we're gonna have about 450 and the, uh, in the digital archive. And the estimate by China, China, um, scholars in China who work in this field is, uh, and who have gone to many libraries to, to, to gather the information, that um, perhaps approximately between uh, 800 to 900 uh, to 1,000 um, collections of women's writings are still extant. So, maintaining women's writing, writings will live on for the reasons that I've given above to serve future research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fong. Um, next present, the next speaker will be Professor Hartiker. Uh, please, Professor Hartiker. Good morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk a little bit with you about the Constitutional Revision in Japan Research Project sponsored by the Reichauer Institute of Japanese Studies here at Harvard. I'd like to just say that uh, I will be dividing our 15 minutes between myself and Kathy Matsuda. I'll speak mostly about the history content and management of the project, and she will address our uh, website and technical issues. So uh, just to say a little bit about the origins of our project, uh, I believe our official starting date is somewhat later, but the real origins was that I and uh, other researchers on Japan noticed during the administration of Koizumi Jun Ichiro, who was prime minister from 2001 to 2006, that suddenly 
there was a great deal of discussion of constitutional revision. Let me pause there and note that constitutional revision <clears throat> has been a, an, an issue for the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, which has been in power for most of the post-war decades since that party's founding in 1955. However, <clears throat> the issue uh, has a, an interesting characteristic in that sometimes it's given quite a lot of attention, whereas there can be years at a time when it is mostly dormant and not talked about. Generally, the LDP seems to bring the issue back when it wishes to uh, enliven its most conservative supporters. It is, if you'll pardon a quick shorthand, a red meat issue for the most conservative uh, element of the Japanese electorate. And another important characteristic about constitutional revision itself is that the issue does not arise mainly from a popular will to revise Japan's constitution, but rather from the use of the party, the use that the party makes of it to shape its electorate from time to time. In any case, in the early 2000s in the Koizumi administration, there was new attention to the issue. And suddenly, just within my very small scope of monitoring such things, I noticed that a lot of religious groups were speaking out on it because constitutional revision as an issue is not just about revising Article 9, the clause in which Japan renounces war, but it's a much larger debate in which many different issues, including religious freedom, separation from, of religion from state, uh, the status of the family, the equality of the sexes, and many other issues are actually implicated. However, at the time, there was a conundrum that I and uh, other researchers whom I contacted about this faced, which was that the debate was mostly taking place on the internet. And at that time, Harvard had no web archiving projects. So um, I and others got in touch with library staff and said, hey, can you help us document and preserve this discussion for future researchers. And they said, well, what you want is a web archiving project. So the library adopted us as one of five pilot projects, which, uh, and ours was the only bilingual one. Eventually, the uh, university library system began to develop its own web archiving machinery, so to speak, and we collected quite a lot of material over a period of four or five years using that system. However, it was eventually succeeded by a number of different um, uh, mechanisms for web archiving, and we found that every time the software was changed, the result for us was the loss of significant amounts of material, or uh, to, to put it in more concrete terms, much of the material that we collected at that time what, uh, ended up on an external hard drive that uh, was then impossible to integrate into whatever the successor system was. So uh, technical uh, issues have uh, kind of plagued our project, I would say, from early times. Uh, one uh, device that we established early on was the management of the project by an advisory group that includes myself, but also a number of researchers uh, elsewhere in New England and also in Japan. So our uh, management and uh, issues of what we should be doing, what our priorities should be, and uh, how we should be responding at any given time to uh, the way in which constitutional revision 
uh, plays a part in political debate is uh, addressed by a larger group. So I think that's uh, one feature of our system that uh, may be uh, unique among the group that we're uh, discussing here today. So we have had a series of public talks, workshops, international workshops, and uh, some smaller publications. We now have a book in press, which is a compilation of around 15 uh, essays on constitutional revision and civic activism. Our focus has shifted <clears throat> from a debate about uh, the Constitution in the sense of black letter law to questions of how Japanese society as in uh, at large becomes involved in the debate. And now uh, web archiving has been superseded by uh, digital scholarship projects such as uh, the ones under discussion today. And whereas we used to act as a repository for data, now we uh, have fo focused on curating it. We collect from uh, over 150 sites at present. And our website, uh, which is uh, under revision right now, has a range of functions, such as allowing a user to compare any of the various drafts for a new constitution of Japan to each other, article by article. And we hope that the website will have uh, broader pedagogical uses that may be made of it, either in English or in Japanese. So let me turn things over now to Kathy with thanks for her stewardship of the technical side of the project. Thank you, Professor Hardiker. Um, inevitably, with a long-term digital project, there's going to be um, occasional transfer of knowledge and a need to think about um, sustainability and preservation as, as has come up in, in these previous talks. And my role at the Japan Digital Research Center in the Fung Library is part of this evolution and uh, movement for Japan projects here at Harvard to find a home both within the library and within the larger institutional environment. Um, ultimately, you know, the reality is that one or two key staff changes can result in a really fundamental project memory loss. And um, in my opinion, one of the strengths of the Constitutional Revision Project has been the um, creation of a mission statement, a vision statement, and detailed project description that was written in its very earliest days. And so really, like no matter what obstacles a project faces, whether it's monetary challenges, technology barriers, or just um, issues with a lack of time, um, I've found that revisiting a mission statement not only provides like a second, third, fourth generation caretaker like me um, with historical and educational perspective, but this type of document can be a map that helps you see a path forward and understand um, ways the original project perhaps didn't quite reach all of its original vision. Um, my, you know, but you know, time and technology can create new poss possibilities and um, what perhaps was not achievable in the past might be achievable today. So um, I'd actually encourage um, all everyone working on a digital project to think about this type of mission, vision statement, um, not only for yourself, but for the longevity of a project. Um, in terms of the Constitutional Revision Research Project, um, one of the original goals within the mission statement was actually a role uh, for teaching. Um, these born digital materials have a potential pedagogical use and um, there had never really been an opportunity to uh, fully explore this path. Um, and this is um, really some of the important new directions we're moving with this project right now, as Professor Hardiker mentioned. Um, the CR project um, has always had a value as a repository of born digital materials and it's always um, strived to meet the needs of the Japan Research Committee. And um, even today, we're, as we build a new platform for the project, um, this is still the center and core audience for the project. But we are currently re-exploring the question of audience and users of the digital project. 
And normally I think any of you who build or work on a digital project know that audience is one of the initial fundamental aspects that you need to address very early in a project. And you might be thinking like, how, how can you be thinking about, you know, who is your audience now after 15 years? But I think when it comes to maintaining and steering a long life digital project, um, I think this is something that needs to be re-examined and reconsidered, um, or at least the expansion of audience um, can and perhaps should be addressed from time to time. So for example, in the case of the constitutional revision uh, project in Japan, it's the primary, primarily the barrier is language that make it, that's what makes it inaccessible on um, whether for uh, students in North America or for other audiences. Um, but the truth is constitutional revision is very, very much con connected to concerns of civil society and issues that affect all of us. And it's a subject that crosses nearly every academic discipline I can think of. So one of our goals has been to think about ways to create greater accessibility and to specifically pivot towards creating a platform that lends itself to teaching. And one of the ways we're doing this is by building um, two mirror language sites in a Drupal environment um, using Drupal 8. Um, one side of the site can be navigated in English and the other part of the site can be navigated in Japanese. So a user can toggle a language bar and move across the project um, in whichever language is more comfortable. And in truth, you know, the 150 or so organizations and individuals that we've been web archiving and following over the span of 15 years um, is always going to be somewhat inaccessible to an audience that only reads English. But um, we're focusing our attention on how to make key portions of this debate available for teachers, students, and researchers who work on comparative constitutions. And so we've pulled out um, and taken 28 drafts of the Japanese constitution spanning a very wide political spectrum that a number of groups have authored and made available online and using um, a pool of very talented graduate students and alumni, um, we are translating these documents into English um, so that many more people can have access to the ongoing debates in Japan. Um, unfortunately, we are in the midst of our redevelopment, and so I can only show you a sneak peek um, at some of the interesting ways we are approaching these materials. Um, and I hope you will join me for a larger unveiling um, in, in uh, 2021. Um, so I'm just going to let's just see, share my screen, which okay, hopefully everyone can see. But um, there are two sections of the project um, in which there's going to be 100% bilingual. Um, uh, everything is going to be 100% bilingual, available in English and in Japanese. And I'm going to just focus my attention on these areas today. And one is the current post-war constitution. Um, um, if, if, if you um, hover over, it's, this is not possible to do right now, but if you hover over various um, sections of the, of the current constitution. Um, there'll be options to select and view various drafts that offer um, differing ideas and wording for these specific um, sections. Or you can um, choose to uh, compare uh, full drafts of the constitution. And here we have a default, that's the post-war constitution. It can be changed to um, historical Meiji constitution or a different draft. And you can go and uh, choose uh, one of the 28 drafts and do a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, I'm not going to show you the other sections today, but the 150 uh, voices um, are going to live here and we're using extensive um, tagging to allow the user to begin to see how the relationships of these um, voices and organizations intersect with one another and what organizations and voices um, are trying to revise which sections and chapters of the Constitution and in turn, what, what are the specific topics that surround each of the chapters and would um, ultimately be affected by um, a revision? Um, we're using um, the exact same materials and content that, um, that we, has always existed in this project from the very beginning, but we're beginning to make the cross connections and the networks um, um, available uh, that, the, that a digital environment allows. Um, and although not all digital projects evolve in exactly the same way, um, 
the con this constitutional revision research project is about to start its third um, and you know, maybe fourth life, depending on how you where you consider the beginning of its life cycle. But um, I think that these cycles of transformation and rebirth are in many ways um, what should be anticipated when thinking about longevity for um, a very long digital project. And it's part of the beauty and um, messiness of digital projects. Um, um, that's all I have for today, and I'm going to turn the podium over to um, Professor Gordon. Thank you, um, and let me stand up since it's a, a little easier for me to talk when I'm standing. And adjust things a bit. All right. Good morning, everybody. And thanks especially to Kwok and to Kathy for organizing this event. Uh, to all of you, um, I see about 160 who are uh, watching from around the world. It's fantastic that there's so much interest in these projects and the question of their sustainability. That's a general question for so many digital projects. And also thanks to the three panelists for being so concise. I've had the experience of being fourth on a group of participants in a round table with a time limit. And it's not always been a happy one in terms of having the time to say what I want to say. So I'm very grateful to that. And I'll try not to take advantage of your um, conciseness by um, blabbing too long. And Kwok, you can, um, inter or Kathy can interrupt me if I do. I'm speaking today about the youngest of the projects, um, the Japan Disaster Archive, or no, the Japan Disasters with an S now, Digital Archive. And it's actually related in terms of inspiration and to some extent structure to um, the project that you just heard about that Helen Hardaker originated because it was the existence of that project with its web archiving component that made me realize immediately after the March 11th Japan disaster in Japan that doing a digital, well, a web archive would be possible and then desirable. Although we were quickly pushed by our graduate students, especially to think more broadly than that, to archive all manner of digital materials in the form more of a database than only a web archive. And uh, that's what's resulted. I'm not going to talk much about the building of the archive, but have it having been built, what are the issues facing it in terms of sustainability? What I'll first do for two or three minutes is show you, share the screen of the archive itself. So those of you who aren't familiar with it will have a rough idea. It's a bit, you can toggle between English and Japanese for all of the writing. I'll keep it in uh, Japanese. One of the key features that's relevant to uh, preservation is once you open up the various filters that this is a networked archive. We have about 15 partners who've each of these archives has its own public facing um, website where you can go and look only at those materials. So one of the key things that we offer is the ability to seamlessly search across all of the materials. Uh, uh, we also offer the ability to search it both by items uh, through a list view, but also through a map view. And one of the things we work very hard on that um, we're quite proud of, but has been technically a challenge, it is also a sustainability challenge, is to have a, there are 500,000 geolocated items in the archive, there's a little over a million total archives, but they don't all have geodata. So those are only accessible through the other type of search. Um, it's a heat map um, for a lot of items, which, and it's quite logical to think that most of the items are concentrated in Northern Japan. It's interesting to see that there's a not trivial amount in Seoul. Um, and as you um, zero in on particular um, regions, once you get below uh, 250 items, uh, then you can search individual items and you can open up, open them up. The other feature of it that I'll just demonstrate live before switching to a PowerPoint, and this relates also to sustainability issues, is 
participation from users that we invite in the form of asking people who visit the archive to build collections of the materials that are of interest to them and then deposit them back into the archive. So the users don't have to do this, but they're invited and encouraged to do this work of, um, and you, as you can see, we have 600 or so collections. About a third of them were built by our own staff at the beginning as a kind of proof of concept. And now that's taken off and users are the, for the most part, the producers of these um, items. So now let me share the screen of a, of a PowerPoint presentation to go through the rest of it. Um, all right, so what are the challenges in sustainability? What's, oh, I'm pressing the wrong key. There are some specific challenges to our archive, and then there are some generic ones that have already come up. Uh, the, the fact of our network structure, the fact of the participatory structure, and also I think the complexity of the platform. The, the software developer who works on this for us, which is an external company, uh, says that our project is the most complex project they've ever done. And that, um, means, of course, there are particular challenges uh, in keeping it uh, going. And then you can see what the generic challenges are. On sustainability, this you already understand. This is, I'm sorry, but this um, is in Japanese, but um, across the top here, just um, uh, seven of the 15 um, independent archives that are accessible seamlessly. So here is the entry port for our users through our archive and through the mechanisms of API. You put out a call for information and it comes from all of these items. There's a bit of material that we've curated ourselves that's here on the left and the right. And the users can also go directly to these archives. What this network structure means is both power, of course, because you can access all of this material. It's the difference between in terms of Expedia or Orbitz, trying to find a flight by going to Expedia and looking across all airlines or having to go airline by airline by airline by airline to find your flight. And so it's very powerful. The weakness is unlike, well, airlines occasionally go bankrupt, but unlike that system, these projects, if one of them changes its, um, its location, changes all its URL structures or disappears, it's gone from our archive. And this has happened once in the case, twice so far, um, once in the case of Yahoo Japan, they, have, they didn't delete all their materials, but they dramatically changed how they're located and how they're searchable. And all of a sudden one day, this is what happened when you tried to access their material. You got this message that said, what you're looking for doesn't exist. It actually does exist, but it doesn't exist in a way that was any longer linked to our archive. Uh, so what can you do to shore up the fragility of a network-based project is the first question. And the solutions, one is to be choosy about partners, and we started to get more choosy, and to make MOUs with our partners that involve mutual commitment and mutual notice and working together if something is going to change. Um, and the other, and this kicked in in the case of the Yahoo project, is to find some savior or backstopper who would help out in a case of emergency. And the Jap Japan's National Diet Library has been very um, proactive in reaching out through its disaster archive that it is rather similar to ours, except that it doesn't have all the participatory elements, which make ours, I think, distinctive. Um, they also are a repository of last resort for these um, archives. And so the Yahoo Japan content is um, available at the NDL. And working with them, it's going to be possible for us to reconnect. Um, it's going to take a little bit of software development work and some cost, but we don't think it's prohibitive. And it's, it's in the medium future plan. We're doing along with Helen Hardiker's project, we're also doing a major upgrade to Drupal 8 as our contact management system. And after that, we'll turn uh, to the resurrection of the Yahoo project. And there's a couple, one other on the medium term horizon that's going to be shutting down its own public face, but happy to let us continue to offer the data. But that's gonna also involve some development work on our part. So the network issue is a 
both strength, the network characteristic is both a strength and a fragility. And so far, these are the solutions we, we have, which are, are not perfect. But it's, I think it's still worth pursuing. The other key feature specific to our project is the participatory structure, which obviously requires continuing participation. And these are some of the um, collections. And you can see the way we seek to uh, build a user community and sustain it is basically through outreach activities and workshops. And we've gotten, this is the one aspect of our project where we've gotten external grants from the Japan Foundation and the Center for Global Partnership. And also our Japanese partners have kicked in to support these workshops as well. And so you can see that some of the collections have been built um, by the, um, it says JDA workshop number two, our, our second workshop, which was held you can see the date, February 28th, 29th in Japan, just on the eve of things shutting down in Japan. We were really lucky to be able to hold this before. If it had been scheduled in March, COVID-19 would have forced, I think, the cancellation of the event. So outreach um, is the key, I think, in building a user community. I should add that I, unlike at least the way the um, China Biographical Database and the Mingqing Women's Writings were described, our project, like the Constitutional Revision Project, has both researchers and scholars as an audience, but also a general public as an audience, including teachers in schools at the level of secondary education, even middle schools, um, high schools, and also the citizens, especially in the disaster area, we're hoping will find it useful. And so we're doing outreach to multiple organizations or multiple constituencies. Finally, um, the complex platform. Uh, one challenge is that the use of our archive, some of it is pretty intuitive. Doing a search, I think if anybody lands on our archive, the, the way you would type in a search term to the main bar and do a search is pretty much generic and obvious. But some of the features, in particular the, the participatory features, and there are more than just building collections, there's the, ability, there's the ability to find a website and contribute it and ask us to archive it. There's the ability to upload your own photographs that you've taken of the disaster and put them into the archive via our curation workflow. Um, some of the participatory aspects of the platform require training toward users. So this involves outreach uh, and building a user community that would then teach others. Uh, and it remains a challenge, uh, but we actually think that the, the COVID-19 and the world of Zoom and people getting more used to um, having webinar type events is gonna allow us to do this type of outreach actually without grants in the future. Up until now, our model for outreach was to get some money to bring a bunch of people together in a room. Now we'll be able to more easily offer um, training to potential users at virtually no cost. And the other challenge, of course, is software maintenance and upgrade. And this requires money. That's the simple answer. So with the solutions to this problem, outreach, demonstrations, which are now more viable via um, Zoom or other webinar type uh, uh, platforms, money. And uh, I'll come to that in just a sec. Not that there's an easy solution. And then a strong relationship with the software developer. Um, the, the company is called ADK. It's based in Boston. We think they're doing excellent work. Um, they've got a certain pride that um, they've managed to sustain this project and they use it for their image and branding. It doesn't lead them to do it for free, but I do think we get a little discount out of that. And um, so having a developer, whether it's individuals or better yet, I think a group, uh, a, a company, um, that sort of buys into our mission in sync with their mission or their economic interest is important. Finally, just very briefly on the generic issues. I think content, continuity of leadership is crucial. Um, none of us um, presenters today who were the faculty members, how to say this without insulting anybody, are extremely young. So, Peter, Grace, Helen, myself, there will be a point in 
the future when we're not going to be providing leadership to the project. Uh, so what to do about that? It's if a project gets too tightly identified with one leader, that can be a problem. And then funding and then technology upgrades. I think the key solution, both to the funding issue and to the leadership issue is to institutionalize it. That can take the form of in the CONREV project, constitutional revision project, creating this advisory group. Um, and it can be in the form of shifting the primary responsibility from faculty to the professional staff um, within a university. And indeed the founding of the Japan Digital Resource Center of which Kathy Matsuura is the head uh, was done with the awareness that we needed to move from, in the case of our project, postdoc project managers. So every year or two, there was the need to retrain somebody uh, to having an ongoing professional staff with a commitment. And so it's wonderful that we have that entity created and that we have such a fine uh, leader of it in Kathy. And the other, of course, solution is money. And the Reichstag Institute was fortunate to have a reserve fund that um, was there at the start so that we could, we could start the project without going to the Dean for permission. Um, we just used reserves uh, and that allowed us to start really quickly. Um, but we, we, we aren't thinking about it and don't think it would actually sit well with our partners if we went the commercialization route that the China Biographical Database has gone. I don't think that is in our uh, field of vision. But, um, and we are fortunate that the Reichstag Institute has committed after this initial startup through reserve funds to a annual budget for the project. But um, it's, it, it remains a challenge. Finally, um, this isn't in my PowerPoint, but one of the, one of the viewers mentioned the issue of um, preservation as opposed to sustainability. I mean, I think institutionalization is the answer there. And in the specific case of this, our project, and I think the constitutional revision project, and perhaps the China biographical database project, having the library step forward as the place that will preserve and commit to preserve once a project reaches a certain completeness, um, and of course, defining completeness is hard. I think that's crucial. And there is a certain tension, I think, between these projects as faculty run initiatives with a research focused and a library or an archive, which has perhaps a different definition of what it ought to be. And I think pressing libraries to take on the ultimate responsibility for preserving, which will carry cost, of course, these projects is an important task that we all have to address. So I'll, I'll end my comments there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gordon. Um, as you may see that there are already a lot of good questions and good exchange in both the chat box and the Q&A. Um, let me start with the first question, uh, which also echoes the frame and the title of this uh, event, Long Live the Digital Project, because uh, as you might know that the previous sentence before the long live is the digital project is dead. So um, there's a very good question from Cole Calford. Um, he asked, um, for these projects, more than 95% of them are digital scholarship and digital um, humanities. What are your suggestions on projects sunsetting? What, would, what should projects be addressed during the early stage of the project life cycle to preserve their eventual outputs? And how do we shift from sustainability of ongoing work to preservations of, of complete work. Uh, this is also a question uh, first came from my mind when I penned this uh, uh, event. Uh, how or when should a digital scholarship project end? And 
how about the output and how we can preserve it? Uh, I would like to, to listen more from the panelists. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and. Uh, so let's uh, very briefly, let me propose that we have, that the answer to that has multiple facets, right? There's a question of, of data, right? There's a question of the user interface, right? And there's a question of uh, shareability. But um, we can take data and preserve it and GitHub through Dataverse and things like this. Preserving a user interface over a long period of time is very difficult. And Andy Gordon, Professor Gordon has already referred to the fact that, you know, Yahoo changes and all of a sudden you're stuck. Um, the third issue I think is will you, a user who has a project that is finite, that has an end, will they make it, will they say to the world, go ahead and use it as you wish, right? Um, even if you don't give, give me credit. Um, you'd like them to, but very often in the digital world, people don't. So with the China Historical Geographic Information System, for example, we simply make the data sets available and we hope people will cite them, but if they don't, they don't. But um, if we want work to be cumulative, it seems to be we also have to be willing to say, and here you can use, uh, you know, the, the common uh, licenses and, and that, that you know more about than I do to say, yes, anyone can use my data and they can do things with it. Others? Um, if I could speak to that issue uh, from just a slightly different perspective, I think what's liable to happen is that <clears throat> to the extent that we uh, depend on funding from within the university, there could come a time when there is pressure from newly starting, starting up uh, digital humanities projects for uh, a finite amount of funding. And that at a certain point, new projects should and would inevitably uh, demand equal uh, access to the available funding and should be given it. And that it may be that in the long term, some of these projects will end simply because other projects are found to have greater priority and uh, that the funding institute may want to fund a broader variety of projects at a lower level than might be sustainable. That just occurs to me as one possible outcome of the situation we face right now. Yeah, let me jump in on this because it's also a question that the I think in the either the chat box or the Q and A box was addressed to me direct. Well, no, how how broad chronologically is the definition of disaster is a question that actually relates to the uh, whether when it will end question. When we started this project in 2011, its name was the Greater East Japan Earthquake um, or the Higashiyon Daishinsai Digital Archive, one disaster. And we had a notion of a 10 year frame. That was because some of the projects in Japan that were also launched and who became our partners had had a 10 year funding commitment or a 10 year commitment. And so we figured that we would be collecting and archiving websites for a decade. Um, as time went on, we realized that some of these issues, most particularly around Fukushima, are going to have a much longer life as live issues and even for that project to end some of the data collection. And, and as Peter said, there's an end date in terms of collecting new data. There's an end date in sustaining and maintaining a user in, interface. And th those are very different things. But uh, so even had we limited it to one archive, I think we'd, we'd go past the 10 year um, limit. But we decided to add an S to the project in 2016 or so when we did the first major remake of the platform and call it the Japan Disasters Digital Archive instead of naming it to a specific archive. And there have been disasters, none at the scale, fortunately, of the March 11th one in Japan. And so we've um, been collecting and inc incorporating some of that material into the archive. Uh, 
uh, is COVID-19, of course it's a disaster, is that something that should be within our remit, is something we've discussed internally, and for the time being decided we don't have the capacity to add the web archiving of that disaster. But since we're basically a networked archive, we're hoping that, and I believe it's already beginning to happen, there will be uh, digital archives emerging in Japan, focused at least on the Japan portion of that, which is only a tiny, tiny portion of the global story, of course. Uh, that we, then we could link up with, we hope, in the future. But the, what all this means is that our original idea of a decade-long horizon and then handing it over to the library or something like that was not the way things turned out. And my sense is that this project, or I, my hope is that this project will continue indefinitely to bring in new materials as new disasters emerge and will continue to have support uh, both within the Institute and a wider world. Um, you, you know, I've thought about sort of unexpected changes at Harvard that might make it hard for us to sustain things. And uh, my thought is that that's where strong partners in Japan are important. Mm -hmm. And handing this over to Tohoku University, handing it over to the National Diet Library. There would be some costs to that because especially if it's the National Diet Library, they won't, they'll be too afraid to allow the participatory things to happen. Uh, Tohoku University might be less afraid, but, but certain aspects would be sustained. So, uh, I mean, there's no good answer, but I, I think that um, at least for our project, we're not seeing it as something that has an end date. Um, I would like to also speak to um, this quest, these, the questions about end, end, end dates and so on. Because uh, I was asked um, in the Q&A um, by someone uh, about if I have any succession plans uh, in place. So, so that's like what Andrew was mentioning about like we're not going to be you know um, working on these uh, directing these projects for forever. There's an end point in terms of our own involvement in the project, and you know in 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 the specific case of the maintaining women's writings, it, it's, it has not the question is not critical because we have achieved um, a very fortunately um, you know sustainability. Uh, and the preservation is, is there for what we uh, have or will have completed. But of course, the aim um, of the project is to be uh, as complete a, an archive as possible of, uh, of the extent collections uh, of Mingqin women's writings. So um, how to go forward uh, you know, from that? And I think I heard some ideas about you know, forming advisory committee, um, you know, exploring uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, uh, sustainability beyond uh, just one's own institution, but of course you have to work with the, your own institution first uh, for their willingness to, um, to, you know, to form, let's say, a consortium or something like that for the, the libraries, and for the um, for new projects. You know, the, also some 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 um, in the chat or question and answer asked about that. You know, well, where to host it? Where to have it hosted? I, th I think that depends very much on the nature of the project, what kind of project it is. Um, you know, so it was kind of natural for meeting women's writings uh, to be hosted by the McGill University Library Digital Collections because it actually contains, you know, uh, digitized images of, of collections of writing. Uh, a, a user can go, it, it's not, uh, so it has both the, the, the sort of the, the traditional, you know, engagement of reading a text, you know, you can do that, you know, online, but you can also play with the, you know, search functions and data, uh, and, and the data and so on. Um, but new projects, well, it depends on what it, it is. Not all projects can be, uh, you know, housed in the library. Uh, but as there's so much, it's part of digital scholarship that's developing, right? New digital databases that, um, you know, that, that younger generation of scholars are, are doing. Um, I think universities really, I don't know which department or unit, but to think about how to, um, how to support, you know, and, and, and uh, these uh, 
new you know developments should there be you know a a the university have a um a place where they would um house uh or host um uh e, e, you know an e scholarship and, and and digital uh projects uh for for their own uh faculty um so again but there's so much institutional variation um that you you can only sort of like try to work right within your uh, when you're trying to develop something um with 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 your um I don't know, within your own institution to explore the, the venues and, and possibilities and potentials. But yeah, my succession plan, well, I, I, I think about it, <laughs> but I don't have a concrete one yet. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to sort of shift, but there was a question about um, um, outreach and um, what what are some of the ways we can do outreach and um, uh, I was just going to say that um, the library conferences um, are really an excellent way to to uh, think about outreach because each of these professionals um, take the projects back to their home institutions um, and they are often um, consulted uh, with by, by students and faculty um, on various subjects. Um, but also there is um, um, an AES digital expo. Um, last This year was supposed to be the second uh, digital expo. Unfortunately, we um, weren't able to, uh, because of the cancellation, it didn't go forward. But the digital expo is also um, a wonderful um, platform for outreach and um, and um, Kwok Lung and I, have, uh, Kwok Lung has been um, talking about um, potentially um, creating a, a, a an opportunity, um, maybe monthly, for young scholars and graduate students to um, present their projects and discuss their projects. And maybe that's um, that's another way to sort of um, launch and get feedback for some of these things. And, and these are just a few of the ideas that. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to agree with, uh, with Kathy very much, and Professor Gordon has also pointed this out. Um, you know, if we don't, part of uh, doing this was we discovered we were way ahead of users, right? And so helping uh, potential users catch up, holding repeated workshops. We've held workshops uh, thanks to Wang Hong Su and Sui Le Kang and others around China. Um, also in the U.S. and Europe, and we really need to uh, we need to show people what they can do. But even if you think about visualizations, right? How do you take the data that's generated by a query and visualize it? There are lots of software packages for network analysis and and mapping that people need to learn as well. So there's a toolkit in a sense uh, of that. We've thought I know that uh, the Rice Institute has hosted people in, in, at Harvard before to help them learn how to use these things. Uh, I think it probably is going to be a good idea to have a, um, something that really devotes energy to helping collaborators learn how to collaborate and to contribute. Right? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I see the time is already exits two minutes. Um, okay. This is a very great, uh, uh, this is a very great panel. Uh, I would like, at the, before letting you go, I would like to do some um, advertisement for our forthcoming uh, digital scholarship event. Um, so in October 2, there will be an event organized by uh, Kathy. Kathy, would you talk about it? Oh yes, we're very fortunate to have um, really, I think the, the, the top up and coming um, young digital scholars in the Japan field um, come and give a presentation about um, digital um, pedagogy. And um, this will be um, Dr. Pollock Curtis and Dr. Uh, Tristan Brunel. They're gonna um, uh, talk about how they've used um, Twitter, Instagram, um, 
WordPress and podcasts in their lessons um, that really span from medieval pre-modern time to uh, you know the modern period. And I, I, I think I hope in this kind of digital learning environment that um, many of you can learn something from this. And then uh, in October 29, we will have the second webinar of the uh, East Asian Digital Scholarship Series. We will have uh, Dr. Uh, Wang Xianglan from Academic Seneca who will demonstrate the Academic Seneca Digital Humanities Research, research at Wong. And on October, uh, sorry, November 12th, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Yevia Cha uh, who will give us a presentation on the the big data turn in the humanities selling into uncharted waters. And um, as Kathy mentioned, we are going to uh, uh, pan uh, more casual and um, more like a community time for the digital scholarship uh, uh, community for uh, aimed at the young scholars and uh, graduate students to uh, demonstrate and show their uh, project to the world. And the first one will come on November 20. Uh, more detail of all this information will be sent in, uh, will be sent to you in the following up email of this event. Uh, once again, I will, I, I thank you all the uh, uh, speakers of this event. Uh, this is a very great panel. Uh, I think there is no conclusion for a lot of questions, but definitely we will have uh, more discussions on these topics. Uh, for the Q and A uh, uh, answers and the question, I will put it into a word file, and I will send that word file in the follow up email too, and also the chat box. Um, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for participating in this uh, event. Well, so there were, there have been a lot of questions and I've been typing away as everyone talked to try to give answers to them. Um, yes, Andy, yes thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, there's a question for Andy, but and, yeah, Andy, there's a question for you about how widely you define disasters. Right. Do you think I didn't, I thought I had answered. I, maybe I didn't see the answer. No, I didn't answer it in writing. I thought I kind of answered it orally in my comment about end dates, but not really. Are we still, by the way, audible to everybody who hasn't signed off? Um, yes. 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 They, they can still hear us. Well, yeah. all right. I'll, let me go I, into I, the I, chat. I, let me go into the chat function and see. But of course, I don't know if that person is still um, still there. Um, if I can find it, open. It's one of the open questions. Yeah, yeah we I'll, have a lot, of, uh, a lot of a lot of thanks and things like that have come up. So. Oh, here it is. I'll I'll type an answer. Oh, Under Gwendolyn is still there. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if you're still there, Gwendolyn's to it. Why don't I just orally answer it? Um, uh, are you? I, well, let's see. This um, reply is very recent. So basically, natural. Well. The idea of a natural disaster is complicated because in one way to thinking about it, um, if a natural disaster like an earthquake happens and there are no people to observe it and experience it, it's not a disaster. So there is no such thing as a purely natural disaster. They're all social. Um, and um, we have tsunami, earthquakes, tsunami, um, floods, uh, torrential rains, um, um, in our radar and what's come up now is whether public health disasters should be considered disasters and this has come up in the case of COVID-19 and in my mind it is a disaster that falls within the remit of something that calls itself the Japan Disasters Archive ought to be attentive to but it's so vast and it's also a global disaster in a fundamentally different way than any of the others that we treat are that um, I'm feeling stuck on that. Uh, but in at some point in, I mean, the, the remake of our project that we're doing with Drupal 8 is going to give us the capacity to add a checkbox of choosing your disaster. 
right now, there's no way to do that. And also, we haven't tagged all of the March 11th items as March 11th disaster because initially that seemed like a totally useless and redundant tag since that was the only thing that the archive was. But to the extent that we have multiple disasters in it in the future and with the ability to sort by them, we'll have to figure out some way to retrospectively in an automatic fashion, tag all of those items as March 11th. So if you wanted to look at only then, you could. And we have some material on the Kumamoto earthquake. We have some material on the torrential summer rains on a couple occasions. And those are tagged by those items. So our plan is, at the moment, we're thinking of what it would, are typically understood as natural disasters that have a social impact. Um, and the, the big question is where, what we do with epidemics, pandemics. The other thing we have a commitment to is going back historically, disasters that happened before our archive existed. And we do want to, there's, there's a fine digitization project for the Kobe Awaji Hanshin earthquake in 1995. And the, the people who created that have committed to partnering with us and making that material available. We just haven't had the bandwidth to do it. And also there are some issues on their side of having their, with a partnership, the partner has to uh, format the material in a way that's importable to us via an API. And that is involves cost and effort on their part. But we think we'll be able to do that. There are some 1923 earthquake archives that we'd like to connect to in the future. So, I mean, we're thinking pretty broadly, both in temporal terms and in type terms about disasters, but it's, it's the pandemic has made us, um, well, we're not just not sure where we're going to go. Thank you very much for the recording. Uh, I will stop recording.